Good morning. I want you to take your Bible. I want you to find Genesis chapter 45. And after you find Genesis 45, I also want you to take your worship folder that you received on the way in. I want to pull this card out from the middle. Everyone pull this out. If you're a guest of ours, we would love to get to know you over the next week or two. Thank you for worshiping with us. Would you please consider putting your information on the front of this card? And for everybody, would you please let us know how we can pray for you and your family. You leave this card in your seat. As you leave or on your way out, you can drop it in the offering baskets in the foyer. We appreciate your help letting us know how we can be praying for you. I also want us to take a moment. Let's look through several of the items in our bulletin. I want you to go ahead and be aware. We, we see updates often about We Care Food Pantry. I really mention it from the podium, but please take a look at the needs that they have for that food pantry. Uh, it's a wonderful ministry in our area, and we appreciate the way our church is able to be involved in it. I also want to let folks know that Divorce Care is about to start uh, another 13-week session. It begins Sunday, May 15th. So if you have questions, if you have any interest in that, please email us. I also want you to notice that they're looking for leaders. So if you're interested in helping serve in our divorce care ministry, would you please let us know? And let me just tell you, this is a powerful ministry God does throughout the year for people who are in need of gospel ministry during a very difficult experience in their life. It's a rich ministry opportunity, so I would encourage you to consider being a part of it. I also want to highlight something I'm very, very excited about uh, this doxology study, I want everybody to put on your calendars, I want you to put a note on May 15th and May 22nd, 4 p.m. right here in the worship center. Matt Presley is going to be giving us two sessions on the doctrine of worship. It's going to be rich time and I cannot wait to come and just sit in and learn and soak and cherish the nature of worship. So would you please consider coming to doxology? Again, that is May 15th, May 22nd, 4 p.m., right here in the worship center. If you've been to any of our Ember lectures, it's kind of a similar vibe as that. And we look forward to uh, gathering for doxology. I also want to mention uh, a couple things that are not in our bulletin here. Uh, this coming Thursday is the National Day of Prayer. Some of you may know that. And what we are going to be doing is providing the worship center that afternoon from 12 to 4. For those who would like to just come in for a time of prayer, we intend to have prayer prompts up on our screen. Uh, and we'd be making ourselves available as best we can for those who may need prayer. It's just to come and go, kind of on your own. And so the worship center will be open from noon to 4 this coming Thursday. Uh, and we would love for you to come and take up that opportunity uh, and sort of join in that collective prayer effort. Also, let me highlight a couple things for the women's ministry. Go ahead and put a note, ladies, on May 21st for the Saturday sunrise. Uh, I know you guys had a great time. For those of you who were at the tea, raise your hand if you went to the tea yesterday. Heard it was a great time. Also heard something strange. I heard that there, there was creamer provided for tea. Not sure you can trust somebody who drinks tea with creamer, but that's, that's an interesting little thing there. Glad you had a good time. Go ahead and note May 21st for the next Saturday sunrise, but let me also highlight this. It is in the back of our worship folder here on our dates. Uh, this coming Thursday is at the well. And ladies, I want you to know it's going to be a special time. Kaylee Huntsinger will be teaching from Psalm 23. Who doesn't love Psalm 23? So that is this Thursday night, 7 o'clock in the point all ladies are invited. Uh, they would love to have you there. Uh, I believe that's all that I'll mention for now. There are other things being highlighted. Please look through all of this. Uh, I want to pray over these things, and I want to pray over our time in the Word. And I don't want to rush this moment. So just kind of settle in, and would you join with me in prayer? Let's bow. God, you, you have been so good to us this morning. Better than we are aware, better than we even know to respond in gratitude. You've been so good to wake us to another day in the world that you have made. 
to have an opportunity to spend another day in relationship to you, another day anticipating eternity with you. Another Sunday morning to gather with the church, to hear Scripture read, to pray, to sing, to preach, to be around brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the body of Christ. Another Sunday, we thank you for all that. God, I thank you for all the things that I was able to mention and, and the others that are in this worship folder that are just a sampling of the ministry that you are enabling us to do as a church. God, I pray for the We Care ministry. I pray that you would use it to the fullest to provide for those who are in need and that you would use that ministry to connect them to an opportunity to hear and embrace and experience the gospel through local churches. God, I pray for our divorce care ministry. I pray, Lord, that you would bring your, your selected participants for this next season. God, I pray for gospel hope, healing. God, I pray for redemption to be experienced. Lord, for those who, who participate that may not know you, I pray that they would experience conversion through divorce care. And God, I ask that you would raise up the additional team members that you have for them as they're seeking more to help lead and serve the ministry. Lord, even, even from among those hearing this right now, Lord, would you tap them on the shoulder as you see fit to team up with that ministry. God, I want to pray for doxology. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the desire that Matt has to do this, to teach to us the, the meat and the substance of what it means, what the idea of worship means, and why we do it, and how we're supposed to do it. God, I beg you to grow Chapin Baptist Church in our worship, in all the fullness of what that means. God, I thank you for the women's ministry, that they had a good time yesterday at the tea, Lord, and I thank you for the the events coming up. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint Thursday night. That those who gather at the well would, would worship you and feel your embrace, connect with one another, and savor you through your word with one another. Lord, I pray for the next Saturday sunrise in a few weeks. Lord, would you use that time to strengthen faith, to provide fellowship, to, to foster opportunities for discipleship? And God, now I ask that that you would be gracious to us this morning. As we have your word open before us, I pray that you're gracious to yet again speak through your word to us. And we have to beg you all the time. We beg you to open our ears, Lord. We, we don't in our own nature hear and respond to your word. It's by your grace that we can do so. So we pray for waves of grace. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would, would move like waves of grace among us now. I pray that you would remove distraction. I pray that you would soften hearts. I pray that you would open minds. I pray that you would humble spirits so that when we leave here today, we know as Jaw-dropping as it is to say, we know we've been in the presence of Almighty God and we have heard you speak to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we find ourselves in Genesis 45, beginning in verse 16. Last week we saw Joseph identify himself to his brothers. Now we're going to see, well, what in the world is going to happen next. Let's begin in verse 16. I want you to see a picture of these brothers reunited and restored. Genesis 45, verse 16. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives 
and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and gave them provisions for the journey. Now I want you to watch the picture that's painted of what Joseph does for his brothers. To each and all of them, he gave a change of clothes. Now, isn't that interesting? I wonder how long it took for them to think about taking his robe away from him all those years ago. And how he gives each of them a change of clothes. I think Joseph, maybe deep down, is flexing just a little bit on his brothers. Now, he's being gracious, yes. But at some point, they would have recalled, wow, remember the time that we collectively took his clothes? And now he's giving us a change of clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. This reminds us of how he gave Benjamin more to eat in our previous passage. And then this echo of something that's happened, he gave him 300 shekels of silver. Do you remember how much they sold Joseph for? 20 shekels of silver. I wonder how long it took for one of them to do the math. I did the math. I actually had to use a calculator. I admit that. 15 times as much they sold him for. 15 times. It just so happens to be enough. Every one of them could have received 20 shekels and their father. And Joseph would have had enough to keep for himself and his two sons. So much he gave Benjamin. And I wonder, I just wonder if any of them thought about that. How humbling this would have been to see Joseph display such extravagance. Verse 23. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. And again, I wonder how long it took for them to realize that there were two donkeys for each restored brother. Ten brothers contributed to him being sold into slavery. They traveled back from Egypt with all of this provision, with all of this gift. And then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the way. This is one that made me scratch my head through the week. Why would he say that? Why would he tell them that the quarrel sounds like something a mom would say? But then you really get to thinking about it, and circumstantially, they had a lot of tension that they could have been thinking about on their way home. They've just, they've just been confronted by Joseph. Do they really know how things are going to play out? Can they be confident that he's going to maintain the grace and the compassion and the love that he's shown? Do they need to start to think about who's really to blame? Maybe they would try, be tempted to try to jock into position, say, you know what, I really wasn't for selling him anyway, and it was really all Simeon or you. And he knows that that's the human tendency. He says, don't quarrel. The connotation of that word also has the idea of do not fear, do not fret. This is a Vivid picture of reunited brothers who are restored by grace and compassion and love. He does not want them to fret. He does not want them to fear. He doesn't want them to quarrel. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And I consider this sort of like a mini gospel proclamation. It's like a little mini gospel here. Joseph is still alive. The son that was dead is alive. And he's ruler. It's a little hint of the gospel coming up. His heart, that's Jacob's heart, became numb for he did not believe them. Can you imagine hearing that news? Too good to be true. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived, a revived spirit. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. We see brothers reunited, restored, and we see a glimpse of the gospel. News that someone who was 
reckoned dead is actually alive. Being told that when someone believes in that news, their spirit is revived. It's a glimpse of the gospel, hopefully by now. If you've been walking through Genesis with me all this time, you know that over and over and over we see and hear glimpses of the gospel. All right, let's keep going. Let's see what happens. Chapter 46, verse 1. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. So he went to a significant place where his father had a significant worship experiences as well. Verse 2 says, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Which is interesting because he told his father Isaac not to go down to Egypt. But now God says, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. He says, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt. And I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Now there are four promises made here. Or maybe four components to an overall promise. And I want to use this to kind of give us the framework of the rest of the message. Let me point out all four specific promises. Number one, he says, I will make you to a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. Number two, look at what it says. He says, I myself will go down with you. Number three, he says, I will also bring you up again. And number four, Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So those are the four promises. I will make you into a great nation. I will go down with you. I will bring you back up again. Joseph will close your eyes. In a vision of the night, God gives Jacob all these promises, which begs the question for us to consider that he would probably wonder, is this true? That's what I want us to ask for the rest of our time. Is this promise true? Are these promises true? Well, let's keep walking in our text. and Let's see what we determine. Verse 5. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones, their wives, and the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons, his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. Now these are the names of the descendants of Israel who came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jakin, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Ur, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola. Puva, Job, and Shimron, the sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob at Bedad Aram, together with his daughter Dinah. Altogether, his sons and his daughters numbered 33. The sons of Gad, Ziphion, Haggai, Shuni, Esbon, Eri, Erodai, and Erali. The sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, Bariah was Sarah their sister, and the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malchiel. These the sons of Zilpah, whom Laban gave to Leah his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob sixteen persons. The sons of Rachel, Jacob's wife, Joseph and Benjamin, and to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On, bore to him. And the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Beker, Ashbel, Gerah, Naaman, Ehi, Rosh, Mapim, Hapim, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The son of Dan, Hashim. The sons of Naphtali, Jazil, Guni, Jazer, and Shalem. These the sons of Bilhah whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter. And these she bore to Jacob, seven persons in all. Now, after we just survived all that genealogy, if you're new to this, I realize you may have a couple questions. You may be asking, do they really read these boring parts of Scripture? Yes, we do. 
And they're way more fascinating than you might initially think, which leads me to a second question you may have asked. Did he really have that many children through that many wives? Yes, he did. And if you find interest in that, just go back and read the rest of Genesis up to this point, and you'll see how all that played out. Very intriguing stuff indeed. Let's keep reading. Verse 26, look at what he says here. All the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's son's wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. A nice, round, full, biblically saturated, symbolic number. Seven times ten. Jacob is moving to Egypt. And you may have picked up on this already. Jacob has another name. Israel. So our God's promise is going to come true. Well, so far, what we see is Israel moving down to Egypt. Let's keep going. Verse 28. He had sent Judah ahead of him. That's Jacob. Sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot, went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen, He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Will God's promises come true? Well, at least we see them beginning to come true. At least there's hope. Joseph really is still alive. Jacob has moved to Egypt and now Jacob is is reunited with Joseph. And reading that text is a challenge to me because I know I cannot read it with the the fullness of emotion that's being narrated. I mean, just for a moment, try to imagine what it felt like for Jacob traveling with his caravan, his family. Finally, after all these years, seeing Joseph, and he's in a chariot, in all the splendor and in all the glory of being second in command of the kingdom of Egypt, and he sees Joseph, and Joseph approaches him and hugs him, and they weep. Imagine being Joseph. Seeing all your brothers again, they've made it back. And then seeing your father for the first time in over two decades. And being able to hug your father. Jacob and Joseph are reunited. One of God's promises is that Joseph would would close Jacob's eyes. Well, for that to come true, Joseph would have to be alive, and Jacob finally knows for fact Joseph is alive. Let's keep reading in verse 31. Now, Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come to me, and the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have, When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now. Both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. And this may seem a little offensive to the shepherds to hear that shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. But it's interesting God is able to use this in his providence because he was going to keep the people of Israel isolated. He promised he would make them a great nation. He didn't say you're going to become part of a great nation. He didn't say you're going to become part of the Egyptian kingdom. No, they're going to be made a great nation and they are given the opportunity to live in isolation. Let's keep reading. So Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, My father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They are now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men and presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? 
They said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds as our fathers were. They said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land, for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan, and now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen, and if you know any able men among them, Put them in charge of my livestock. So they've been given the best shepherding ground, and now they're being given opportunity to be responsible for the the royal herds. This is just example of blessing upon blessing. God is paving the way to fulfill his promises. Verse 7, then Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood before him, and stood him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many are the days of the years of your life? Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. They have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. Now, we would not consider 130 years few. Raise your hand if you want to live 130 years on your current trajectory of how your body is keeping up. (laughs) So like, I hope your day was better than mine yesterday because yesterday I spent five hours out doing yard work. I hate yard work. Raise your hand if you like yard work. Raise your hand, keep them up because I got to know who I can't trust. Hate it. My body this morning feels like I am 130 years old. And yet Jacob says, few are his years. Few are the days of his sojourning. Such a helpful word. We're just passing by in this world. We're just on the way in this world. Look at verse 10. Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. Now let's just take a step back at that last chunk of Scripture Let's observe that Jacob is brought into the throne of Egypt. And watch this. Israel blesses Egypt. That's what's happening. Jacob is the patriarch of Israel. He's the one given the name Israel. He's blessing Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. Israel is is blessing Egypt as the people of Israel are settling in. You may have noticed that they were put in the land of Ramses. It's been called Goshen over and over. Then it's called Ramses. That's what that area would be named in due time. By the time the book of Genesis is being written, by Moses' day, the Israelites had helped build Ramses. God has made these promises where God's promise is true. The answer is yes, but only as experienced by faith. Think about these promises. Think about Jacob's expectations. So again, the four promises that God gave, I will make you into a great nation. I will go down with you. I will bring you back up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Now, those are the four promises in the order that God gave them. Let's think about the expectations that Jacob naturally would have taken with them. Here's the order. He would have expected God would go down with him. Then God would make them into a great nation. Then God would bring them back again. And then Joseph would close his eyes. That's the order that Jacob naturally would have expected these promises to come to fruition. I will go down with you into Egypt. And there I will make you into a great nation. And then I will bring you back out of Egypt. And Joseph will close your eyes. That 
likely would have been Jacob's expectations, but let's think about how they were really experienced, the order that Israel experienced them because it was not in that sequence. Yes, God went down with Israel into Egypt. But the next thing that would be fulfilled is that Joseph, Joseph will close Jacob's eyes. Jacob will die. And then God, for quite some time, will be making the people of Israel into a great nation. And then he would bring them back up. That's the story of the Exodus. You see, God's promises were true, but Jacob had to experience them through faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40, it says, All these people, and you remember, if you know Hebrews 11, just lists off people from the Old Testament and describes their faith experience. All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Jacob did not receive what was promised. That's what Scripture's telling us. Why? We get an answer in the next verse. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Jacob did not experience the full fruition of God's promises because God was providing something better for us. And I think we can view ourselves in this verse. Yes, we're not the original recipients of the letter of Hebrews, but this is how we can experience the promises. What about us? Now, let me define us. I'm not necessarily talking to every person in this room. I'm only talking to people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's who defines us. That's the us of Hebrews. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Christians, saints, whatever word you want to put there, those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. So what about us? How do we experience the four promises that God gave Jacob all the way back? Because we do experience them, but in a different order. Number one, God is making his name great among the nations. Or a little corollary thought. He is making us, followers of Christ, he's making us a gathering of the nations. God is fulfilling the promise that he gave Jacob. He says to Jacob, I will make you a great nation. He's fulfilling that in a way that surpasses Jacob's biggest expectations. It's not just about one nation. It is about God, his name, being made great and glorified and celebrated from people of all nations. That's what God is doing. And I put that first because that's what he's been doing since way before you and I came into this world. God is fulfilling his promise. Let me go through the next three, then I'm going to give you some responses to encourage you. Number two, God came down for us and promises to go with us. God told Jacob, I'm going to go down with you, and I'm going to bring you back up. And God has fulfilled that promise way more than Jacob could have expected. God came down himself for us, and promises to go with us, God with us. He came down in his son, Jesus Christ. It's the incarnation that I want us to celebrate for a moment. He came down for us and promises to go with us. So I want you to look at the incarnation. Now I am talking to every single one of us, including those of you who do not follow Christ. And I am so glad you're here with us. If you are not a Christian, I want you to know this. God sent his son. God the son came down for us. That's the incarnation. God became flesh. Why? Because he promised to go with us. God with us. That's what the name Emmanuel means. Now as you look at the incarnation, I want you to realize this is for non-Christians. I want you to hear the invitation before you. Look at the incarnation. Look at the fact that Jesus Christ was born in flesh, all God, all divine, and all human, all man. That's the incarnation. The becoming flesh. 
And I want you to know that the incarnation now implies an invitation for everyone in here who is not already a follower of Christ. He came down for us. Died on the cross for us. Rose from the grave. He did all that in our behalf as our substitute. The incarnation implies an invitation. In just a moment, I'm going to encourage you about what to do regarding that. Third promise. He will be there when you die. God told Jacob, Joseph, his hands will close your eyes. Especially back in that day, that meant so much to have a selected loved one be the one to usher you into whatever was next from their worldview. We experience this as the third promise. He, God himself, if you're a follower of Christ, he will be there when you die. And then lastly, he will raise you up again. He will raise you up again. That's the order in which we experience God fulfilling these promises. He's making his name great among the nations by making us a gathering of the nations. He came down for us, promises to go with us. He will be there when you die. He will raise you up again. So let me finish by giving you four ways to respond. One for each promise. They all start with the letter R if you're taking notes. First is, you probably need to repent. This goes for everybody. When we hear that God is making his name great among the nations, we should probably automatically repent of something because our tendency is wanting our name to be made great. That is idolatry. God is making his name great among the nations. And we have this. Every one of us does. You may consider yourself the meekest, shyest. I don't care if you hate the limelight. Like I'm up here doing what is considered the most fearful thing among humans. I'm public speaking. So I'm up here. By the way, if you've never done this, once you get up here and turn around, you realize how bright these lights are. And then you look at this little sea of faces here. And some people would be terrified to do this. Even if you're the shyest most refusing the limelight person, there's this little kernel in your soul. This goes for all of us. You want to be made great among the nations. You and I, we have a tendency. We think we are the most important being on the planet. That is our natural bent. No exceptions in here. But God is making his name great among the nations. So I would beg every one of you to consider how you may need to repent. Say, God, I'm so sorry. I, I in my natural tendency, try to, to steal your glory. I try to get it for myself. I try to make life about me. I try to spin the world around me. I think if you're honest with yourself, if I'm honest with myself, it doesn't take long to find examples of that. So repent. Just repent of that this morning. The second promise, he came down for us and promises to go with us. Again, this is mainly for non-Christians. If you do not believe in Jesus Christ, my, my encouragement, my exhortation to you is to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to receive the truth of the gospel. Again, he took your place on the cross. He took a punishment you deserved. For those of us who are followers of Christ, we've already been made aware of this truth and received it by faith. I don't believe everybody in here is a Christian. I want those who are not Christians to receive the gospel. That little bentness that I just described about how us wanting to make the world about us, that idolatry, the punishment of that tendency is hell. It's God's wrath forever, and God is just and good to give that punishment, but he's gracious. He gave you salvation as an opportunity to receive. He sent his son. 
So the first thing you would need to repent of is your sinfulness and receive the forgiveness that has been secured for you in Christ, the love that has been secured for you, the hope, the joy, being a part of the body of Christ. Well, you can ask, well, how do I know it's secured? We know it's secured because Jesus rose from the grave. He conquered sin and death. The resurrection secures all of that. Like the victory's already won. Already won. The other night, Noah and I were watching a basketball game. We're watching the Memphis Grizzlies. That's our favorite NBA team. Okay, it's where we, it's where we hail from. Those are our people. Memphis, the bluff city, right? So we're watching the Grizzlies, and I mean, it's back and forth. For a while, it didn't look good for the Grizzlies. But we hung in there. We stayed with hope. We watched till the bitter end, and we won. We had to wait till the very end to see the victory. Let me tell you guys, our victory in Christ is already secured. Not a single amen. That's all right. I'll... Hey, you know what? I'll blame myself. I just must not have done a good enough job preaching that one point. I mean, I hear amens here and there, and not one there. Our victory, it's already at hand. We are watching things unfold, knowing God has already fulfilled that promise. All right, all right, okay, all right. All right, it doesn't mean the same after I begged for it. Just so you know, it's sort of like my mom telling me I look handsome, okay? It's just not the same. All right, but I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll, t- I'll be able- hey, I heard like a hundred amens today. I mean, revival. We were knocking it out of the park. All that to say, if you're not a follower of Christ, receive Jesus Christ. Receive what only he provides. The Bible tells us there is salvation in no one else. All right, the third promise. He will be there when you die. Now, I want you to think about this. He will be there when you die. I'm talking to followers of Christ. The fact is that's true for non-followers, but there's a totally different implication. I'm not going to sensationalize that. I'm talking to followers of Christ. God tells Jacob, Joseph's hands will close your eyes. You may have paid attention that Jacob has been fixated on his doom, his demise all throughout this whole narrative. This was such good news. Too good to be true. That his favorite, long lost, thought to be dead son, his hands would close Jacob's eyes. God is going to fulfill that promise to the fullest for every one of his people. Listen, saints, listen to this. He will be there when you die. And what I want you to do in response to that truth is I want you to rest. We've seen a lot of funerals of this church. We're going to see a lot more. And I want to help play my part. I want to play my part and help prepare people for the moment that you die. And this is one way to help you, to tell you. He will be there when you die. Listen, I can't guarantee anybody else will be there. Do you know that? Think about people, the precious stories that you hear, where the loved one is surrounded by their closest, most beloved family members, and it's almost as if they've been waiting, they've been kind of holding on. This happens all the time where someone seems to be holding on. The doctors say, hey, you you don't have long. You may want to gather your family around if they want to. Come see your loved one. And they're holding on. And there are times where maybe that last person, just to complete the circle, that last person's there. And that's when the person can finally release and expire. Those precious. I can't guarantee any of that for any of you, myself included. Because you may not be surrounded by loved ones when you die. You may be getting hit by a semi-truck. You may be totally alone when you die. But he, he will be there when you die. And I want that truth to just saturate your soul. I want you to rest in that hope. Rest in it. And finally, he will raise you up again. God told Jacob, I'm going to make you a great nation. I myself will go down there with you and I will bring you back up and Joseph's hand will close your eyes. 
He will raise us up again. What do we do with that? Well, we rejoice. We rejoice. Did you know this is why you'll come back next Sunday? Because of this truth right here? We come back next Sunday because of the resurrection? And we'll come back the next Sunday because of the resurrection? If we don't come back next Sunday, it's because he's come back. We'll be rejoicing in our resurrection. Rejoice. He will raise you up again. I want you to think about how that changes everything. Let that be. Let the resurrection be the filter of your life. Let everything go through the filter of the promise that God will resurrect you and me and we will spend eternity with Him. Let it affect every day. And I'm saying that to you knowing I need to hear that as well. This is sort of a mutual pep rally. Rejoice in the promise that God will raise us up and then rejoice seeing that even as far back as Genesis 45, 46, and 47, he's showing us he's going to fulfill it all. So maybe you need to repent. Maybe you need to receive. Maybe you need to rest. Maybe you need to rejoice. Maybe it's some combination of some or all of those. I want you to bow your heads. And I want to pray for you regarding these responses. God, God, I pray that that each one of us would discern how we need to repent of trying to usurp the first promise. You are making your name great. Among the nations, we want that for ourselves in all sorts of subtle, satanic ways. It goes all the way back to eating the fruit in the garden, thinking that we should be the ones to know good and evil. God, I pray that you would bring up our self-idolatry May we repent of that. That would be such a healthy thing for individuals here, for families, for this church family, if we repent. God, I just, before brothers and sisters, I confess my own tendency to want to make my name great, to want to be considered great, to want to expand how I am viewed in this world. Lord, I pray that you would graciously humble me. God, I pray for those who need to receive the gospel. Holy Spirit, this is a work that only you can do. I ask that you would bring to life souls that woke up dead this morning. That if anybody does not know you as they woke up this morning, if anybody did not know you, I pray that right now as they've heard the gospel, they would realize how much they needed the Son of God, to come and to die on the cross and to rise from the grave and that they would receive the truth of the gospel, that they would confess that you are their Lord and Savior. Holy Spirit, that's a work only you can do. I'm begging you to do it among us. God, I pray that you would provide rest. Lord, I especially, I, I want to pray with a, with a pastor's heart, a shepherd's heart, I pray for those of us who have gotten along in years. They don't feel that their years are few. From our perspective, Lord, there are many in this room who know we've lived a full life. Lord, the, the reality of their death every day is just more and more imminent. God, I pray that you would sustain their soul with the hope and the joy and the fact the biblical fact that you will be there when they die. God, I know that no matter the age, we all need to be aware of that because none of us knows how long we have. I pray that we will rest in that promise. And God, I pray that we rejoice. You are the God of resurrection life. You have promised to raise us up again. God, I pray that we rejoice. That's why we sing. We have nothing to sing about 
if there is no promise and fulfillment of resurrection, and yet you've promised it, you've shown you're going to fulfill it most significantly by raising your son in whom we have all our hope. So God, I ask that we would rejoice, and I pray this, In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Church, would you stand together as we respond to God's word this morning? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to save that thou art thou my best thought by day or by night waking or sleeping thy presence my light be thou my wisdom and thou my true word I benediction, I want you to receive the next two verses from the passage that we read in Hebrews earlier. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen.